guys. Thanks for coming out. So yeah, this talk is called Hitman Levels as Social Spaces, the Social Anthropology of Level Design. Uh, my name is Mette, and I'm from uh, IO Interactive. Oh, and I've also been told to just ask you to put your phones on silence, <laughs> um, just in case. So this talk is divided into three parts. Um, the first is the context. I just want to tell you just a little bit about me and IO, um, what Hitman is, in case you haven't played, uh, what it means to be a level designer at IO Interactive. Then I want to tell you the story. So this is pretty much about how I, when I started IO and we launched Hitman 2016 and how that went down. I want to talk about a specific level that was super popular and a level that is super close to my heart as well. Um, and then I want to introduce you to the concept of social spaces. And then we have the learnings. I want to tell you about how we used social spaces to look at all the levels and compare them in Hitman 1 and what that meant for us going into creating Hitman 2. All right, so this is uh, me <laughs> some years ago. Um, I just got my first computer. I was sitting in an exciting day and I got to paint the walls of my room as well. It's a jungle theme, in case you can't see it. Uh, <laughs> So I work at IO, which is right there. Uh, <laughs> that's Denmark, in case you don't know. Denmark, um, we made Lego. That's us, so you're welcome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then uh, there was an incident with a giraffe a few years ago. I don't know if you remember. We killed a giraffe and showed it to a bunch of kids. It was awful. But anyways, in case, <laughs> maybe now you remember us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and we have a queen, it's a monarchy, it's very weird. Uh, she doesn't really decide much, but she's pretty cool, um, actually. <laughs> and we make Hitman, very proud of Hitman. Um, so what I'll be talking about is Hitman um, that we call internally Hitman 2016. Um, and I'm gonna talk about Hitman 2. So what's special about these two particular installments of the series, that's a quite old series, like we started, the first Hitman was in 2000. Um, but here is where we really defined um, the game in a way. Like we went back to um, the concepts of blood money, like where we make these deadly sandboxes, as we call them. We went back to a different recipe, a different design mantra. We wanted to talk about freedom of approach and creativity, uh, really giving the player um, the chance to design how they want to play the game and, and do their own approach. And of course, that meant a lot for the level design as well. So level design at IO. Uh, the reason why I have this slide, because I know a lot of you probably know what level design is, <laughs> um, is because I heard that it's a little bit different at IO, and I assume it's different everywhere. Um, it seems like such a broad field. So I thought I would just want to try and explain what is it actually we do at IO. So <laughs> we think. <laughs> design is, of course, as you know, like about coming up with uh, different approaches, like ideas and, and solving different problems. So, uh, and the level designer is quite central in just coming up with stuff for the levels. Um, we're often being asked to pitch the levels, uh, pitch targets, locations, uh, anything. We're a really central part of the early process of this. And preferably we should try and do something a little bit different, a little creative, cool kills and stuff, right? Uh, then we're part of the layout process, of course, and this is where we work very closely with the environment artists, uh, our artistic counterpart, um, <laughs> the ones who know how things should actually look and, and <laughs> how, it, how it looks realistic. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, it's, a, it's an important process that we try and keep outside the editor. We do a lot of paper prototypes and a lot of different uh, mock-ups, layouts to see how it feels. And I will say, when we do it for Hitman levels, um, we talk a lot about the different activities that we want to have in a level. So we mark up activities first, um, like different disguises and stuff like that, and then we try to, to look at how would it actually feel, like how, how would you represent it in a physical way afterwards. Then we mark up in the editor with gray box, white box, all that stuff, whatever you call it. <laughs> um, and then the environment artist tells us that's weird. <laughs> you wouldn't have that many covers everywhere. Um, uh, <laughs> and then we implement pretty much everything. Um, my producer said when she had to explain what level design means for other people or to other people, she would say it starts and ends with the level designer or starts and ends with level design. Um, we implement pretty much everything that goes into the game. Um, we touch everything at some point. Uh, and that's everything from like set pieces that game designers make for us and different acts that the animators make for us, um, 
dialogue, everything. And then we talk. <laughs> Meetings and stand-ups, and we constantly, constantly talk to other people. Um, the level designer is a product owner at IAM. Um, so as the main level designer on a project, you own the level, uh, and you're responsible for making sure that everything flies and that you talk to everyone uh, in, the, um, in the team. And we have an awesome team, uh, really, really talented people. Um, and then we do janitor work. <laughs> I guess this is the same everywhere. <laughs> yeah, if people ask me at the end of uh, production, what do you do? I just say, I'm a janitor. I'm a janitor. <laughs> just walk the halls of the levels and make sure things uh, are still working. Yes. Um, this is what it looks like when we're in the editor. Um, and this is just like a, a, like a small, simple setup. But, but the reason I'm showing you this is because it's a really central part of what we do. Apart from uh, mocking everything up, uh, one of the most important things that we do uh, in a game like Hitman is making life, uh, creating uh, drama situations, as we call them. We borrowed a little bit uh, from the world of theater. <laughs> we talk about dramas and acts and roles. Um, and this is just like a, like a simple setup where you just have a guy who's on the phone. I just want to show you this just for context so you know what it looks like. Um, all right, so another thing that's super central when we design levels um, is looking at trespass. Where can you actually go uh, when, you, uh, when you start the level? And this is a situation from uh, Miami in Hitman 2. It's the first level. Uh, you're at a, a race event. Um, and right now, I'm trying to get into a backstage area, but I'm not allowed um, because it's a big public event. And it, back here, it's like for employees only. But uh, if I become the, <laughs> the mascot of the event, this cool flamingo, obviously, I can go there. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, I'm allowed. This is what we call social stealth. Um, so you try to blend in. And this is what makes uh, Hitman the, the best assassin in the world, in, in our world, <laughs> is that he's willing to do anything to get uh, wherever he needs to go. I just want to show you like a quick video, because I think someone else did a really, really good job <laughs> of uh, showing you uh, the different ways that you can infiltrate uh, in our games. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to show you this quick video. All this time, with each attempt, each creative assassination and each unique exit, you're learning. You're learning the level. You know that you can get into the mansion by dropping down here, or climbing over here, or popping in this window, or going up from the pier, or using a keycard or blowing up this wall, or just walking in the front door. You're learning the schedule of your targets. You know that Francesca will come down to the lab on her own if the virus is destroyed, or that Caruso will come to the observatory if the roof is opened up. You're learning which disguises will let you into which parts of the mansion, ways to separate the targets from their guards, where to get keys and key cards, and which exits you can take. Yes, um, and I actually recommend that video if you're into Hitman level design. He's, uh, yeah, he, he's super talented. Um, so yeah, so that was the context. Uh, me, IO, uh, Hitman, level design rule. You know everything now, so that's good. Now I want to talk about the story, what actually happened. Um, yeah, and talk about this, this level that did, did really well. Okay, so in 2016, sorry for the white screen, <laughs> uh, we launched. Um, and what was so special about this launch was the fact that it's, uh, it was episodic. It was the first AAA episodic game, maybe probably st still the only one, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and I, I had just started, right? I was a new designer, I was an intern at the time. I was just trying to figure out how do you make a, a good level uh, in this crazy game? Like, how do you actually do that? Um, and what happened was that uh, we would get a meta score for each level we launched. Um, and that makes for a super excellent case <laughs> for, for, you know, actually trying to find out how, like, how do we do it, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, it's a little awkward for the work environment, I will say. Uh, that, like two tables down, someone got a different meta score than you did. That was really weird. Uh, <laughs> so I can't recommend it. Um, but it was super interesting. Um, and this got me started like thinking, okay, 
um, like what worked. And Sapienza, which was the second level that we ship, was uh, where we really seemed to convince at least the reviewers um, that this was, uh, this was working out really well. Uh, and it was really everyone that seemed to love this level. It was our, um, our fans and it, like, it was user research. And I love that level personally as well. It's uh, this Italian coastal town you just saw. It was the same one in the clip before. Um, and it was actually just awesome to go and work in that level because it was like sunny and awesome. So I just felt like I was on vacation when I was just working on it. It was really strange. Um, but yeah, I tried to, to sort of dive into, you know, what makes this cool. Because it's, it was a, it's, you know, the weather is nice. It's a nice place. It's beautiful to look at. There's all these things. Um, the, the village is, um, like you have this big villa in the middle and then you have like this village that's surrounding it. Um, and the objective is to kill Silvio Caruso, uh, Francesca de Santos, and destroy the virus that they have in the basement. Uh, but when I looked at the reviews, um, everything they seemed to talk about actually didn't have anything to do with the mission. Um, it, like they were all describing how it felt to just be there to just walk around in this beautiful little village uh, that had all these little stories and these weird like uh, characters and these nice little places to visit. So, <laughs> I love the ice cream guy. <laughs> He's gonna figure it out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so my question became, instead of like, how do you make an awesome level, I, I decided to dive into something a little bit different. I wanted to find out how do you design everyday life? And how do you design believable everyday life? Because that really seemed to be what people were describing. So I looked at my uh, level design toolbox, uh, and I had all these cool like, like, uh, concepts and, and uh, terminology to describe the gameplay elements of it, like how do you make nice trespass and sentries and blah, blah, blah. But I didn't actually have anything that could help me solve this problem or answer this question. So I went back to the books. Uh, <laughs> I had one semester of social anthropology <laughs> in, in university. Uh, and some of this stuff just seemed to click for me when I started to think of it in that way instead. So I uh, went back uh, to, uh, <laughs> to Pierre Bourdieu and Erwin Goffman, um, who are specialists within um, sociology. And Erwin Goffman is also from the field of anthropology. Um, and they describe some pretty cool things. Um, Pierre Bourdieu, he talks about social capital. He also coined the, the term social space. And his idea is basically that, um, that we are all in this social marketplace exchanging capital. Um, and if you do one thing in one social group, that's gonna, um, that's gonna get you in, in a way, right? That you, you uh, like for instance, if I buy like a fur coat, um, in one social group that's gonna make me look super cool, in another one they're gonna hate me for it. So you know you have to choose wisely as you're navigating this social marketplace. Um, and Evan Goffman, he talks about front stage backstage, uh, which I think is like one of the most applicable things also to Hitman. So that's the idea that we have different um, personas depending on where we are and what we're doing. So when I'm standing here talking to you, I'm front stage meta, but when I'm crying in the bathroom afterwards, I'm backstage meta. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and I think like, this is really interesting when you start just looking at spaces. What, like, what are the rules of spaces in general? Um, when you're in a job interview, it's a super tense situation. The space has kind of been laid out for you. It's gonna be four chairs. You're not allowed to sit in those. It's gonna be a table between you and you're gonna sit in that one chair being judged by the other, right? That is the, that is the setup of that room. And you just, you know, like, what that's gonna be like. It's gonna be uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and it's designed to be uncomfortable, <laughs> I think, in a way. Um, and the square, I think these are really interesting because they don't have uh, rules, in a way. Like, it's, they have them, but they're very vague. There's no owner of it. There's, like, not, like, that one person who's gonna be like, you know, put those pants back on. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more, uh, a lot of different spaces can meet in a space like this and a lot of different people and it can change depending on who's there. Um, a sports event, 
<laughs> you know, it's that, you know, you, you can almost do anything in a sports event as long as you're just, you know, voting for the right team um, and, and doing it at the right time. <laughs> And I think this really applies to games as well. Um, when we design these spaces, um, and that could be any game, it doesn't have to be Hitman, um, we're designing uh, rules of behavior, and we're designing uh, you know, something that's going to tap into your, uh, to your knowledge of how should I be in this space. And it's very subtle. Like People walk into these spaces and they don't go like, oh, now I'm in a church, I'm gonna be like this. No, they just, they just do it without, without thinking about it. Um, and that's very, very powerful, I think. Okay, so I tried to take these concepts and make it applicable to Hitman levels. <laughs> um, so I divided it into two different categories, so public, private. Uh, private just being anything that's trespass. Public is anything that's available to you when you start playing the game. And then I defined it a little bit further than that. I'm just gonna go through all six of them just so you know and give you examples. So the first one is a public space. Uh, this is the square, it's the park. It's like the space where you feel like you can kind of do anything and you won't be judged. Uh, there's gonna be no expectations towards you. Um, this is where uh, the player can just like relax, wait, take their time, uh, you know, look in their inventory and not feel like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> and these are just really great spots to just, yeah, let the player breathe. Um, they're great for starting locations. Um, then the next one is the public purpose space, and this is where we just ramp it up just a little bit. Like there's still no one who owns the space necessarily but you feel like you should be doing maybe a specific activity when you're here. Um, like this, like a back alley, it could be a cul-de-sac, it could be like a marketplace, anything where you kind of, you feel like you should have a purpose when you're here. And these are great spaces for just like creating life um, and flow in the level. And we have the public rule space, this is one of my favorite spaces. So these are the spaces that are, again, still um, like available to you from the start, but they have super strong social rules. Like this is where you know that you should behave in a very specific way, like the church or an ice cream shop. Um, and they're great for role playing, because they, you know, as you walk in, the player knows that like, this is the way I should behave, but I can also go against it and break, you know, break the rules, uh, act like an idiot, and that's fun too. Um, and they're really, really good for us in, when we have to communicate uh, trespass rules, because often when you have a super powerful rule space, then the player will just know, okay, I'm not allowed um, you know, behind that door into the, the priest's private, uh, private room. Of course, I'm not allowed there. And I know there's gonna be a priest. I know there's gonna be a choir board. I know all this stuff. Uh, I, don't, I don't have to tell the player anything. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's ripe for the picking. Then we have the private space, kind of like the first public space, it's very vague. Uh, it's just, this is just trespass, there's not necessarily gonna be a lot of people or someone who owns the space or any special activities. Um, but these are really, really important too. Really important because these give you little breathers. So you need to make sure that they're there as well, they're represented as well. You don't wanna cram it uh, with too much stuff. Um, private professional, yeah, so these are like, <laughs> like the most important for us when we design spaces because this is where we can just, um, there's gonna be specific rules, you're probably, you're not gonna be allowed there when you start, um, but the player can easily figure out um, who's allowed here. Um, like the kitchen, the kitchen is like one of our favorite rooms in Hitman because so many things can go wrong in a kitchen. <laughs> it's a nice place for accidents. Um, and you know, you can find poison there, all that stuff. It's, they're nice. Um, but they're really good for social stealth. They're good for role playing. Because again, yeah, you can just walk in, you know, I'm going to be a chef. I'm going to stand here and chop some onions. And no one's going to notice me. Um, yeah. And then the private personal space. So this is the reward for the player. Like, we don't have a lot of these, and we shouldn't. They're like, these little gyms uh, in the level. This is where you, um, where we tell you who the target is through the environment. This is really where you feel like, whoa, okay, I've, I've gotten super close to the target now. I'm not allowed to be here. Uh, there's so much stuff here that's gonna tell me how to um, manipulate them or, or take them out. And these are just, yeah, great for stealth, social stealth, 
on role playing, um, but you shouldn't have too many of these. It's, uh, they need to feel special. Okay, so I tried applying all of these uh, and trying to map it out uh, on Sapienza to try and see is there anything that's, that stands out from doing this. Um, and one of the things that struck me uh, <laughs> was the fact that the public area is just enormous in this level. Um, Square meter wise, it's not half because like the um, uh, the mansion has like many um, many different storages, and you have like the whole cave and all that stuff. And as you get into the church, like there's more stuff. But um, but it's an enormous area, and it really allows the player to get all the way around the mansion, which we coined the fortress because we have lots of these fortresses in our levels. Um, and you have a chance to just. Uh, traverse and you have a chance to just see, well, how do I want to get in? I really have a chance to just uh, find all of these different opportunities to either infiltrate um, our fortress or try to pull out our targets. Yes, so now you know about all this stuff, you're experts. Uh, and now we can talk about the learning. So where I just want to compare it to the other levels in Hitman 1 and just talk about what did we decide to do for Hitman 2? So I did this on all of them. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> it looks simple, but <laughs> it took a while. Um, to try and see like, what can we learn from this. And there's like those tons of little things. I'm not going to go too much into details, but I'm going to talk about two levels that are really sticking out. One of them, you know, Sapienza. The other one is Colorado down here in the corner. So what is, of course, super um, obvious <laughs> as you look at it is the fact that Colorado is only trespass. Uh, when you start the level, uh, you're trespassing. It's a hostile environment. You're not allowed to be here. Good luck. <laughs> um, and I just want to say, first of all, like, I think this is an awesome level. Um, but it did get a lot of critique, and it, it got a lot lower meter score than Sapienza did. Meter scores are not everything. I'm really not trying to say that. You should always be <laughs> critical. but. But I think it's, um, it's interesting to see what happens when you take away half of our tools in making a Hitman level. Because, yeah, this is basically what we're doing. We're only using half of the palette. Uh, and the way that this looks from the top um, is actually quite representative of how it feels when you're playing it. Everything is kind of, um, it's, it's very hard to define the different areas. It's sort of murky. Um, Everything is, uh, is soldiers. Uh, it's, um, it's this orchard that they've taken over. Uh, and it's really hard to figure out, OK, these soldiers are allowed here, but they're not allowed over here. But in Sapienza, you know, the ice cream guy is allowed over, uh, allowed over here, and the priest is allowed over here, right? So it's, com it's a different metaphor that we're using. And it's very, very hard to tell apart. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go through the findings, just so you know uh, where we are. Um, it was four like big things that we felt like were worth worthwhile uh, highlighting. So public spaces are just very useful for us um, because it just uh, represents the initial agency of the player. It shows you where the player can actually go when they play the level, uh, just when they start, um, and they have a chance to just get an overview, figure out what they want to do. Um, the public rule space are just they're just so powerful uh, when playing into player expectations uh, and and we we enjoy uh, when our expectations are being fulfilled. It just feels nice. It's like oh, it's an ice cream shop. I wonder what's oh, it's there was ice in here. Like you know, it it's, it feels nice. You're kind of like I, I already know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> Um, the private personal spaces are just so rewarding because um, they just they create this backstage experience that Evan Goffman is talking about, right? Where you feel like I'm I'm onto them now. They're super expensive to make because uh, it's just so many special, unique assets and all that stuff. But they're worth it. Um, they're really, really worth it. Um, yeah, and by using the whole palette, uh, it's just way easier for us to just create interesting levels. Um, and where players can figure out what to do and how the whole thing ties together. It feels more believable um, and, yeah, and more rich. So we turned these into four objectives. So we wanted to create large and meaningful public spaces. We wanted to create rule spaces that plays with the play expectations. We want to create these rewarding personal spaces. I want to use the whole social space palette. 
Um, and I think we did that. We've all got barcodes on the back of our heads. Most people just never notice. I know what it's like to have everything taken from you. It's a dangerous thing, having a conscience. Why are you doing this? I like to think no one's untouchable. Yes, okay. So I just want to take you through what Hitman 2 looks like now. Um, so this is uh, Miami. This is the first level uh, of Hitman 2. Um, it's an innovation race. And you're here to eliminate the CEO of Kronstadt, uh, who is in that big building on the top, uh, <laughs> which we call the Expo building, the Kronstadt Expo building. And his daughter, Sarah Knox, who's a race driver, she's, gonna, she's driving in her car, and at a point, she's going to sort of roam around in these public areas. Um, so I did the same thing uh, to just try and see what it looks like. Uh, and it's OK if you don't go like, oh, OK, and, uh, like instantly <laughs> you have all the information. Uh, I just want to show you um, this is the public space. Uh, and, uh, and I really feel like we, we took uh, all these findings, and I really think we, we, uh, we applied them in a really, really good way. Um, and even though you can go this far right when you start, it doesn't mean that it's an easy level. I don't know if any of you have pl played it, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, and I think it's just really enjoyable that you can get this far and like, basically get all the way around our fortress um, to get an idea of how the whole level is shaped out. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of our large and meaningful spaces <laughs> that I feel we created. Yeah, this is also from Miami. This is Mumbai, also an enormous level. I think it must be the biggest level we've ever made. And almost like so much of it is public. You have these big two fortresses on either side and everything else, apart from a few areas, is just public. You can, you can get almost everywhere uh, to just get an idea. Um, Santa Fortuna. This is kind of our Colombian Sapienza. <laughs> it's also it's an amazing level with this, um, with this drug cartel mansion in the middle. And you have like jungle you can explore. And you have this, uh, this whole fishing village. Wilton Creek, um, the suburbia level uh, in Vermont. Yeah, and as long as you don't trespass on people's like, property, then you can just, you can just keep. Uh, Traversing our social spaces. I think we, yeah, there's some really interesting ones in season two. Um, we have, we have the, the stands where you can watch the rays. There's a pretty cool moment in the barbershop. I don't want to kill, an, uh, kill anything. <laughs> Whoops, Freudian slip. I don't want to <laughs> reveal anything. <laughs> yeah, the bar in Santa Fortuna, the barbecue. Of course, you need a barbecue when you're in suburbia, right? I wonder what's going to happen here. <laughs> oh, and this is, I think this is a cool example. Uh, I love scale. Um, so I talked a lot about sort of using everyday life experiences, right, for creating rule spaces. Obviously, you don't always have to do that. You can also, like, we have all these expectations based on movies and fiction. So here we're going a little bit with an eyes wide shot uh, and uh, all that stuff. Uh, Yeah, in our personal spaces, I think we, yeah, there's some really, I'm, I feel like I'm spoiling a lot right now by showing you these. <laughs> it feels different when you're there, so I think you should go try them out. Our slum queen in uh, Mumbai. She's taken over this uh, huge train yard. It's a super cool location. 
And where we have our uh, CEO of Kronstadt. Yes, okay, so I just wanna do like a little quick like um, reflection on how this, uh, like how, what happened when we did this. Um, so obviously someone made Sapienza before uh, I started uh, drawing colors on it. <laughs> uh, someone did all this stuff without having these uh, social spaces being so formalized. So this was just an exercise of formalizing knowledge that was already in the company. It just wasn't accessible to me as a new designer. Um, so by doing this, uh, you help new people get into it faster, and we use this analysis also for um, our embedded teams in Sumo, um, uh, and yeah, just for, for new people joining the company. Um, it helped us develop a terminology, and, and words started popping up that had nothing to do with this thing. I've used some of them already. We have the fortress. The dweller is a target that lives in a fortress and won't come out, so you have to go in and get them. Then we have a roamer, which is a target that's going to, you know, roam around in the public spaces. And this, like, we're forcing the player to try different approaches. Um, if they got super good at infiltrating, well, maybe you have to think about how you're going to do it when they're out and about, but you can't do anything, right, because they're in public. And the snail house, that's like um, an idea of how we create shapes, um, like general level shapes. Um, and we found out that the snail house shape is just super awesome for making hitman levels. Yeah. And then it just got us talking. Um, we started like, you know, we actually started reflecting on what is it actually we do. Uh, and I think that was just really, really valuable. So all this in mind, I just, um, yeah, I want to promote this. I think you should try it out. It doesn't have to be um, a social approach. It can be whatever. Uh, you think could be interesting and try and apply it to your game and see what happens. Yes, that was it. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess we have lots of time for questions. I don't know. Um, do you have any questions? I'm not sure how this. Goes on. Yeah. Oh, I think there's a mic up there. If you want to go to the mic, sorry, I was supposed to say that. <laughs> Do you want to start? Uh, You're already. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, because you used larger public spaces in Hitman 2, mm -hmm. uh, did you notice during playtesting that uh, people explored more options within the level sooner because they started in a more safe and low stress environment? Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, it could also be overwhelming, because I was saying that, that we had a new problem all of a sudden uh, <laughs> that we hadn't thought of. Uh, it was a little bit overwhelming for players, um, so we had to find ways to kind of quickly give them something they could go with, um, and then say, okay, for the more seasoned players, we're not going to run over to that guy with the exclamation mark over his head. Um, they can just keep going and keep discovering cool stuff. But we had a new uh, challenge um, all of a sudden, yeah. All right, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm wondering yeah. if you could uh, elaborate on the snail house bullet point. Is that like where the, <laughs> the layers kind of begin to, I saw in Sapienza, yeah. it kind of goes in a half circle of sorts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's about, um, it's easier for people to navigate in them. When we uh, did the, this, um, this analysis, um, Bjarne from uh, the company, um, who's also a level designer, he sort of joined in and we started looking at, at, season, at uh, season two. Um, and he realized at a point um, uh, that our levels uh, in Hitman 1 was either like, either they were um, like flat or they were like horizontal, like we have like uh, Paris that's horizontal and we have Bangkok that's horizontal. And then we have these other shapes where it seems to be a little bit askew and it helps players navigate. Uh, it's easy to figure out where you are, basically. Uh, and there's also something about that we create a path, right, of infiltration, and then we allow you to kind of, we talk a lot about Swiss cheese at IO as well, that you constantly need to have a way out. We hate um, dead ends. Dead ends is forbidden. Uh, so I guess it's the same in, in other games as well. Um, so yeah, so it's basically about uh, giving you a path, but allowing you to kind of learn these little um, other ways in. Uh, and then yeah, the other fortress at the end, right? So it also depends on what kind of level you're making, but we will often have a fortress in our levels. 
Awesome. Did, did that answer everything? Yeah, yeah. no, totally. OK, cool. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so it appears that the level designs are very much geared towards the actual primary targets. Mm -hmm. um, was there any ahead of time consideration for the elusive targets or kind of escalation missions where targets are all over the place? Yeah, yes. So when we're designing these, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, when we're designing these levels, we're, try, we're constantly trying to keep in mind that these are supposed to keep on living, right? Um, that we have lots of content that we want to keep adding. Um, so yes, definitely, that, that goes into it. And often if we have an idea for something where we go, oh, this doesn't really fit here, but maybe we can use this in the future for an elusive or for a bonus mission or something like that. Yeah, we, we try to, um, to keep that in mind. There's lots of stuff you have to uh, design at the same time, and sometimes it feels completely impossible, but it's uh, <laughs> But like creating these huge levels like Mumbai, like where you just have tons of, of uh, real estate, like you just have like a lot of, of slum and lots of places, and yeah, definitely that's, we try to do that, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi. So um, I know that your goal is to make like these realistic uh, environments to portray everyday life, and a lot of the levels are based on actual real life cities mm -hmm. and places. How strict are you with trying to per, um, portray that city exactly how it is versus um, adding in fictional areas or fictional events, things like that? Yes, that's a really good question. I think I'm actually supposed to repeat the questions. Uh, so it's <laughs> so this is about like how um, detailed do we go in recreating levels and trying to make them real. Um, we I think we have like this mantra that we're not trying to create real uh, levels. We're trying to create believable levels, and I think that's very important um, for this also to be fun because it's also a pretty uh, you know. Um, it's, it's basically, it's a hitman game, right? You don't want to go too real, because uh, then it's not fun anymore. And then it, like, we want to keep that um, sort of stylized aspect on most things. Um, we try to just draw, like, take a lot of inspiration from these places. Um, but like a, a level like Sapienza, uh, there is a town that looks a lot like Sapienza. I can't remember what it's called. Um, but you can you can go visit that place, uh, <laughs> uh, and some of it at Io actually have. Um, so I mean, we yeah we draw inspiration from it, um, and we go visit the places. Like for a season uh, for Hitman Two, people actually went to these places uh, to um, to kind of get that feel. How does a slum in Mumbai actually feel? And took tons of pictures and stuff. But we have to make our own version of it, uh, of course. Um, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Good. <laughs> Hello. Hello, thank oh, you. Oh, sorry, oh, are we doing the back and forth thing? I don't yeah, know who came first. By all means, go for it. OK, you go. OK, um, yeah, thank you for the talk. I uh, just had a question on sort of streaming and the way that you actually put your levels together at, mm -hmm. at I.O. because the levels are so dense. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that happens automatically? Or like when you're indoors, you're kind of t you know, chunking out big parts of outside or have you got big level streaming volumes around the whole area or what, what do you mean exactly sorry just uh, uh le level streaming does oh it, okay. does it all happen automatically or are you are you kind of turning off big sections ah, of, of the world? um no I, it's uh it's everything is just uh i actually i'm actually not completely sure do you mean like uh you mean like for the player not when we're working in the editor i'm assuming um, well, yeah, sort, yeah of, okay. sort, of, sort of the development p uh, part of it, actually. So uh, okay. are, are the level designers doing, you know, setting down level streaming volumes, or do you just make the levels and, and that's that? Um, I'm a little bit unsure uh, what you mean. Uh, like, as in, like, when we, when we design them from the get-go, like, how we, uh, if we design everything at the same time, or if we, like, go, like, from this area and then out, or do you mean...? Uh, ju just the, the technical side of it. So if you're okay. inside a building, ah, okay, like it's that. outside yeah, unloaded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, defi we divide things into rooms. That's what we call it. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, okay. it's just the terminology. <laughs> yes. So we, everything is, um, is made in rooms, and then we have gates between those rooms, right? So we try to not uh, show as much as possible. And, and for, for some of these levels, that was a huge limit. Uh, and for instance, um, in Miami, right? Um, 
you can't uh, go and see the whole level at the same time, right? We try to make sure that we put things in the middle and we divide it and make sure you have these super nice vistas, but we can't show you everything at the same time. So, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, that, that's a big part of it, but it's something that, that sort of happens as you're designing it and we have, uh, we have people in the team that are worried about that stuff super early and they're like, oh, this is way too much. Like, we have to just scale sure. back and, yeah. Um. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. So, oh, okay. sorry, Switch sorry, I'm so. completely uh, forgetting this guy. Sorry, over hey. here. <laughs> um, yeah, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious if during the development process you categorize players based on their play styles. Yes. And based on that, <laughs> how did you balance out the opportunities that you design? For yes, that's an excellent question. Um, so this is about how we design for different play styles. Um, well, we need a sneak path always, right? We need to make sure that you can, uh, we need to make sure you can do it suit only in Silent Assassin and all these things. Like we, meet, we need to make sure that it, that's doable when we make them. Um, and uh, when we do like social stealth, there are different types of um, players. Like we have the, um, the center stage social stealth, uh, like Helmut Kruger in Paris. I don't know if you played, but like where you're basically in the spotlight, you are the main character, so like walking out there. And you know, if you're a real hitman, you'll be going like, maybe that's not the place you want to be. Like everyone can kind of see you, but uh, <laughs> but but it's awesome to have those experiences, and it makes you feel like you really cheated everyone. Like uh, they think I'm actually the main attraction of this thing, right? Um, so we try to do that, and we try to do these more like you're doing social stealth, but you're more like sneaking. You know, you're the janitor, like you're. Um, and uh, we make sure that you have sniping opportunities and all this stuff. Yeah, we, we try uh, to, to design these different paths, but players can just come, like they find a way. Like, you know, sometimes you just go, oh, they did what? You know, like, uh, how is that even possible? So um, I'm not, there's some players who are like, we're not too worried, they're gonna find a way. Um, they always do. So, uh, but yeah, yes, we try. Uh, as much as we can. Sorry, right. then back here. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like a super intuitive and really useful rule set, or philosophy rather, um, and I'm a big fan of rules for making levels. It makes life a lot more simple, but mm -hmm. is there a danger that it becomes potentially formulaic, or like, can, do you, can you break those, your own rules? Can yes. you disrupt the system that you've basically established now? Yeah, 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 yes. Um, it's <laughs> like, you're saying like Colorado. You should. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, and, and I want to say these are like, these aren't rules for how, like, um, we may want to make another Colorado. Yeah, that's what it's Right. Because uh, I think Colorado had some super interesting things. And I think we just learned so much in doing this that we know the, the pitfalls. So we can do another Colorado now and, and make sure that the players um, have those same opportunities. So definitely, yeah, yeah, I don't think this should stop anyone. And, and as was also said before, like, did, did any issues come with actually following these rules? And they did, right? Like, we did this and we're like, oh, okay, right. Uh, we need to make sure that they're not overwhelmed by public space, right? So, uh, so yes, definitely, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Um, I was kind of curious if there were any issues regarding um, player retention or uh, hidden challenges, uh, specifically regarding the proportionality of the particular zones. Uh, especially regarding like yeah. the public zones, like if players would get uh, less engaged if they were just walking around too much without any necessary uh, challenges. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's like, again, you need to make sure it's varied. So I think the reason why big public spaces work is because they're varied, that they change. If it was just the same, same, same stuff, like if it was just, just a huge park and there's two mansions on the other side, that would be super boring, right? So. Uh, I think it's about keeping the player engaged, and I think it's just what we learned was that you can keep the player engaged without introducing trespassing. Um, that they'll still, that part of their brain is still going, like, uh, what should I do here? Who's allowed here? Who are these people? What's going on? Like, uh, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Hello, and thank you for the talk. So in a previous talk, uh, you guys spoke about how you went through the process of creating a tutorial mm -hmm. for the stages yeah. and how difficult it was for the players to figure out yes. what's, what are all the actions in the, mm -hmm. in the stage are. Now, before you spoke about the Swiss cheese approach to mm -hmm. getting yourself in trouble but being able to come out of it, yeah. 
relatively easily. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about how you um, modulate the player motivation to fail and think of something else to try again and keep going through that process, <laughs> even though there's very hard stops yeah. in those paths? That's an excellent question. Um, so it's about how, um, when you do trial and error in the level, how do you make sure that the player keeps, uh, can get out of trouble and can, can keep, keep going, basically, right? Yeah, um, I mean, this is a kind of a little bit more over in the game design department, because it's about systems, right? When do we cool down the level and say, OK, everyone's forgotten that guy got an ax in his head. We're fine now, you know, back to work. Uh, it's an <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that can get a little weird. Um, but we try, like I mentioned, like uh, having lots of these, making sure that you have these safe spaces, like making sure you have spaces that, have, that are not filled with rules and expectations or NPCs, making sure you have places that are just like hallways with not that many people or, uh, you know, so you can, you can get away and, um, and sort of feel like you're going from one social context and moving away from it and maybe getting into an entirely new one because then it's okay that they don't know about X, hit a guy. So, you know, it's, it's a, I think in the level design that's what we can do, but I think it's, um, it, there's no perfect, like there's no like, uh, this is the way to do it. Um, and I think it's something that we keep, like we need to keep getting better at because I think it's a really important thing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the addition of multiplayer in Hitman 2, uh, how does that affect uh, how you design the levels with like the public spaces? So you're thinking uh, ghost mode? Yeah, ghost. Ghost mode, yeah. Um, so uh, that's a tricky question. Because, <laughs> um, um, yeah, um, oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that question because I haven't worked on ghost mode. Um, but I would think that it's, okay, so what's really tricky about ghost mode is that um, the, the game tension kind of stays even though you're playing again, right? Uh, so that's like one of the challenges we're facing is that if we do the X head scenario again, right? Some, like in, your, in a big public space with a lot of people um, and uh, you know, lockdown has happened, right? Um, I think that's something that we need, that especially when we uh, design ghost mode, that we need to uh, be mindful of that it's not, that the area isn't entirely ruined um, because there's so many people who saw you do something bad and now when you're playing it again. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, when we design the levels, we need to, of course, worry about the main missions and we need to think about elusives and all that stuff. And now we also have to think about ghost mode. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot, um, so. Yeah, I think it's about that, making sure that you don't have like two large uh, open spaces with a million people in it because that's gonna feel weird in ghost mode. Yeah. <laughs> Hiya. Hi. Because your level design and locales are so inspired, are there any settings that you really want to incorporate into a future Hitman game? Or do you feel like you've already made your dream level with one of the previous <laughs> settings? Oh, I'm working on my dream level right now, and I can't talk about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry, but yes. <laughs> I look forward to playing it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so Hi. my question is about uh, when you create a level which has such a large amount of content, such a large amount of different things you can do, different things going on, different mm -hmm. things happening, different ways of entering, different missions, and there's so much variety and so much there. How do you encourage a player to actually explore that as opposed to go down the path of least resistance and find yeah. just quickly, <laughs> how do I get to my target as fast as possible? Yeah. And then a yeah, second follow-up question to that is, uh, have you ever thought about, or I mean, obviously you have, but what are your thoughts about sort of reusing levels to sort of encourage getting them to, uh, getting a player to, discover more about a level so that right. way they can actually use yes. more of what they've previously learned. Yes. Okay, so this is a good question. It's about replay and how do you make people explore and not just go down the beaten path. Um, so we have challenges. Uh, I think challenges is an excellent tool for like highlighting some of these things that we've put in the level that we really hope for some, that someone will see. 
Um, but I will say, I, I like that there are these little pockets that you may not notice until like the 10th time you play a level. Like there's still parts of some levels that I, ha I haven't seen and I get surprised when I see it. And I think that's an, like a really cool experience. Um, but yeah, we have a challenges, the challenge system, and we have these opportunities like our quest system where we can take them to some of these cool areas that they may not necessarily see uh, from the get-go. And the other question was, uh, yeah, making sure, like highlighting areas for bonus missions and, uh, and elusive targets. I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to, to do that. Um, and I think that kind of answered the first question in a way. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think there's like, if you played some of the bonus missions, like for instance in Sapienza, uh, there's like uh, three bonus missions in that level and, and each are like very different, I feel, and they highlight uh, other, uh, like really nice areas of that level. Um, so yeah, we, we, we try to do that uh, as much as possible. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. yeah they were first. He's first, right. sure. Sure, go. Oh, okay. um, so polite. So you had um, all these great different space terminologies and uh, you worked together with the environment artist about how to set those up. But was there any sort of environment or LD make any visual indications as to the different space types? So like, was there different lighting for the privates there versus the public spaces? And what did that continue through different, different levels? Right, um, though it really depends on the level, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we try um, to, to use these visual cues. Mm -hmm. uh, like that could be just um, having uh, things that aren't very presentable. Like, you know, like bags of trash or something like that. It could be like stuff like that. Or here they just put up some chairs for later, like full of chairs. Or I think like we try to do these little things to make sure it, it very quickly feels like, oh, okay, I'm not allowed to be here. This is a backstage area or, or whatever. And, yeah. And then like we had all the different spaces and then a lot of the layouts that you showed had the public spaces sort of intruding on or sort of wrapping together with the private spaces. Is there some sort of like percentage or anything that you followed? How much public space needed to like touch the... The uh, private the space? Pri yeah. Um, well, it, this is your chance to have the player see right. your private space, right? This is, this is where you get to, um, to really show them this is where you want to go and this is how you can get there. So I don't think it's about how much, mm -hmm. but I think it's about how clearly you do it. Um, and how you show who's allowed there. Uh, in Hitman, that's a huge part of it, right? Uh, the disguises. So you have a chance to see um, behind the fence that it's like chefs walking around there or whatever, uh, okay. backstage people, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. For implementing the stuff you talked about in other games or other types of games, do you have any ideas or recommendations for um, places that might not fit what most people understand about like the people that work there, where it's like, mm. I am seeing someone do something and I want to either become that person or mm -hmm. do what they're doing, but I have no idea what they are doing. It's like in, it's hard to think of many examples other than fantasy, but where we as normal people don't always have the ideas of what is expected of a person in that area. Right, right. So you're thinking like if we go to like more exclusive exotic places where you don't know what, what are they actually doing, like what's their, what's their job or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a challenge. I think that's a, if that's the question you're asking, like how we deal with it or, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's about, like even if you're at this super exclusive weird place, like a Isle of Scale, where it's like everything is over the top, right? And uh, people are wearing robes and stuff like that. You still have waiters, you know, you still have kitchens, you still have bathrooms, they need to pee. Like, you know, you have all of these things <laughs> um, that's going to be there because they're humans um, that you can just play on from there. Or you, you use, uh, like I mentioned, like examples from movies and other games and fiction. Um, so people can go like, oh, you know, he's a cryogenics guy or whatever, like a, or a detective. You know, it's, um, then, then you try and play on, uh, on those stereotypes, kind of, um, yeah. 
yeah, but it is it is super difficult or, or you can um, like again, then you have to invent something new, but then you have to tab into other uh, you know design tricks like um, everyone has a different color or something and everyone who wears yellow will do this thing like in, it, it's a uh, yeah it's super difficult when we do that when we go out and, and explore those areas uh, but I think it's doable it's just um, making sure it's it's readable for the player thank you yes. how long do we have left uh, are we done or is four minutes Okay, cool, yeah. Hi, I have a question actually about uh, the integration of your design and art teams with as richly detailed environments as you have in Hitman and is how intrinsically linked gameplay and mission design is to the environments. How did you guys sort of integrate the work of your environment team and your design team? How closely did they work together? We work very closely together. <laughs> I would imagine very closely, so, yeah. yeah we um, spend all our time together, yeah. Um, like the level designers and environment artists are buddies. Like we, 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 we're partners in crime. We try to do everything together and make sure we're aligned. Uh, yeah. Have our desks right up against each yeah, other and yeah. eat together and, and smell each other and everything. It's uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it shows. Yeah. I think that's super important. Um, like that. The problem as a level designer, I think, I was always I want my like every. Uh, someone from uh, the whole company, from each team representative, just sit around me in a ring, so uh -huh. I can just like a writer, and an animator, like, because you need to talk to all of them all the time, yeah. all the time, but the environment artist is, your, is the most important person for you. Cool. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question for uh, the design of Hitman. You have like so much possibilities and solutions to the level. Mm -hmm. um, even the system, you can ha make many actions to solve a yes. single problem. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, how do you mitigate that at a, as a level designer? As you have your players, so much possibility. Um, do you do some, tino, some kind of technique in order to make it in intentional? So how do we decide like when the level is done? You mean like how do we show the player, or as we're designing, or what do you mean like? Uh, when you're designing, yeah. uh, you have a system and a level that has like so many solutions. Okay, like that. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think there's like many different ways of doing it, of trying to show you uh, how this works. Um, like there's uh, one example. I don't know if it completely answers your question, but there was one I thought it was a little funny where writing also helped us out a little bit. Uh, there's a place in Paris. Um, where you walk, like you have, you can just walk right into the building, and if you walk uh, to the left, and this is backstage area, and this is a chef who's like uh, wants to go in, and the guard is like, "Listen, buddy, you don't have to keep asking me this question. You're allowed here, and you're allowed all the way up to the second floor, and you can just walk <laughs> right in." Like, and I was just I was listening to that. I'm like, "All right, like, <laughs> fair enough." Like, um, so you know, we we do all kinds of little things. Sometimes it's not that much on the nose, but it's. Uh, but yeah, but it, it is super hard to communicate. Like, what can you do here? And as you're saying, there is a system, there's all these things. And the minute you uh, knock out someone in front of everyone, then the AI takes over. And it's anyone's guess what's going to happen now, right? <laughs> uh, so we're, we're trying to cater for all of it. And it's a, it's, it's a crazy job. <laughs> it's so much fun, but it's a crazy job, yeah. Did that answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. OK, we can talk after this. Yeah. OK, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And your left, yeah. Hello, hi. Hi. Uh, so I'd like to ask, because uh, there's a lot of maps in the game, so every maps are like really different, so how do you guys decide on what kind of map to use? Like, do you think about like assets, reusable assets, or like you recreate every single, like different assets for different maps? Um, oh, that depends on a lot of things. Um, like, we try to make them as different as possible in general, and that's just expensive to do. Yeah. But we try to do that because um, I think it, it's important that they feel different. Uh, we don't like reusing. Sometimes you have to uh, if you're time pressured or anything like that. Or if it's just like, okay, we don't need a million different toilets. Like we can maybe reuse a few toilets. Like no one's going to notice. Um, like it, it can get a little insane once in a while. Uh, but. Um, but I think it's super important to make them feel very different. But, and we, we do lots of, lots of things to make sure it feels different. Like, uh, like 
sound and lighting and all this stuff, making sure that, that the time of day is, is different and the mood of the level is different um, and how they look and how they act and how they talk. Like there's so many aspects to making sure they feel varied. Um, but it, but it, I think it's very, very important that they feel different. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. I think you're, uh, you're off. And oh, we're done. Can I, one last question or? Oh, we're done. Oh, we gotta go. Okay, well, we'll talk after this, okay? Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you.